Hello and welcome to Highland Country Fellowship. Really glad you're here if we've not yet met. My name is Bill Rector. I am delighted to be the teaching pastor here. And I get, every week there are a few more people that are coming back. Maybe they've had their shots. Maybe they're just tired of not being here. I don't know. Um, and then there's... And then there's people that are here for the very first time today, and I'm kind of sorry about that, but uh, no, we're, we're really glad you're here, whether this is your first time here. And by the way, I don't know if you guys realize this, this room is filling up, and there's still more people watching online. So if you're staying home and taking care of yourself, we love you, man. We can't wait to see you again. Um, and uh, we hope that whether you're on site or online, as James says, that you experience the, the welcoming friendship of this body of believers that just seems to have kind of fun getting together. You know, I think church is supposed to be fun, and I think we prove it, right? So, yeah. I, I, don't, I, I don't know. That's, it just feels that way. You know, since the very first time I came here, it didn't feel like it was work to have to come. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad, and I'm, I hope you experience that. I also hope that you experience the ease of worship. You know, Worship is something we should do every day. Every day, at least once a day, you, need, you should submit yourself to the fact that God is God and you're not. And in, the, in his holiness and greatness, the problems that you have, they're still there, but you get a much different perspective on them. And I really think that's something we should do every day. But it's so easy to do uh, in this company. Perhaps we're led by such gifted people, perhaps just in the company of others filled with the Spirit. Uh, I hope you experience that as well. And then the third thing that we promise every week is that we will go verse by verse through God's Word, uh, because really that's, that, this is what has the power to change you. This is what is living and active, and I don't have to argue it, I don't have to defend it. It's like a lion. I just have to kind of open it up and let it out on you, and, and it does its, <laughs> does its stuff, man, so... Um, so we are, we are in Galatians. We have just kind of started and kicked off a study in Galatians. And uh, uh, actually, I, I guess we haven't kicked it off. We've been a few weeks in it. We're in chapter two of it already, which for us is just breakneck speed. I pulled a, <laughs> pulled a muscle going through it the other day. Uh, and last week we had, you know, when you go verse by verse through a book, you have this Forrest Gump thing. You never know what you're going to get. And last week, we had a really tough confrontation between Peter and Paul. And this week, we, we get one of the greatest verses of all time about salvation and the glory of God. It's one that you should consider maybe having tattooed on the inside of your eyelids. Um, and if that's too violent, just put it on the refrigerator for you. But let's, let's do this. So, so we, we, last week we had this confrontation, and, and we're going to kind of pick up with that. So let me just introduce you to that. And it's chapter 2, verse 11. When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. And this is Paul speaking, because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. And this is, this is where we're at. Paul was going to address Peter specifically, and then he's going to broaden his argument. He's going to address all of the, the Jewish believers that are there, and then he's going to finish with something that's so timeless and universal that it almost needs no context. So I'm really excited. Let, let, let's keep going here. Champ, uh, verse 14 picks up for our stuff this week. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, you're a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners... Know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law. Because by observing the law, no one will be justified. If while we seek to be justified in Christ, it becomes evident that we ourselves are sinners, does that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. 
If I rebuild what I destroyed, I prove that I'm a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And this, beloved, is the T-bone steak word of the Lord today. Last week, we kind of had to chew on a little broccoli, you know, and it's good for you, I'm, I'm told. <laughs> this is the word of the Lord, and the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And to, the title of today's message is Becoming More Like Jesus. Becoming More Like Jesus. We pray that every Sunday, that we would be made just a little bit more, that, that, that we would look a little bit more like your son. And that's part of what's going on here, along with a lot of rich theology. And Paul is going to spend a lot of time in the rest of the book of Galatians discussing this idea of the law versus grace of Jesus. And do you have to do one or the other? Do you throw one out completely? It's all a beautiful argument that is going to take much of the book. But for today, he begins with this single confrontation. It's just, it's like a like a pebble thrown in the pond. It starts with Peter, and then it goes out to the, the Jews that were around the table, and it ends up really around the world. Let's start in verse 14. Let's see how this works. Uh, by the way, we talked a little bit about verse 14, but not enough last week, so here we go. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, you're a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs. So here's the thing. Peter grew up being Jewish, right? So he has all of the customs and ceremonies and laws, but he now knows something. In just the last few months, he's become aware that these Gentiles have received the same Holy Spirit that he received. So they're fully in the family of God. There's no argument with that. And he also knows something by a personal revelation that occurred to him in Acts chapter 10, that there's no longer anything as clean and unclean foods anymore. And if you doubt that, I, I almost dare you to read Mark chapter 7, where Jesus declares all foods clean. So he, Peter knows these, these people, these Gentile believers, they're my brothers and sisters. And he also knows that whatever they're eating is fine for me to eat. And he was doing that for a while. He was eating with them, and he was eating like a Gentile. We joked last week, it might have been the first time he ever had baby back ribs. <laughs> and so Paul confronts him. He says, what are you doing? You're a Jew, and yet you're living here like a Gentile, and now you want to force these Gentiles to do this? Did, did observing the law save you, Peter, or was it Jesus Christ? Right? Did observing the law ever save anyone? And that's the question. See, but in addition to that, there's something a little bit more nefarious. The reason that he had to confront him so aggressively is it's this idea of, you know, Peter, your actions don't match your words. That's the definition of hypocrisy, isn't it? You know, and I, I, <laughs> I used to hate it when people say, well, I don't like going to church. It's full of hypocrites. That's right. <laughs> I, and I am chief among them. I mean, what else do you get when you have people who know they're fallen who try to live up to a perfect standard that they know they never can? That's hypocrites. You know, I try to reduce that, but we're all going to do that sooner or later because we are trying for perfection. We are submitting to a Lord that asks us to obey the Ten Commandments, and we can't. And so we all are going to fall short. Anyway. So Peter, he says, you're living this hypocrisy. And here's the problem with your hypocrisy. Because you are eating with these people and shunning away from these people, they begin to think they're second-class citizens. And that's not what God wants. And worse yet, these Judaizers over here, when you're eating with them, they, they think they're right. And you know they're not. So this isn't just about which table you sit at, Peter. This is about the fact that your actions are speaking really loudly right now, and i got to call you on it. Throws the flag. But it affected some other people, too. Verse 13 said that a lot of other people, other Jewish people were led into hypocrisy. Even Barnabas got caught up in this. Barney. So he broadens his argument. 
And he, now he argues with, he, he's, he's talking to the Jewish people that are there. And I want to make sure we understand who these are. These are people that grew up Jewish and have now accepted Jesus as the Messiah. And because they accepted Jesus, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they knew it. And this is where Paul goes. Verses 15 and 16 are really, really cool. There's a lot here. We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, and you really do need to hear the sarcasm in that. That's why it's in quotes in your Bible. It's because, and by the way, I know something about sarcasm. I majored in it, right? <laughs> so um, this, is, this is sarcasm. We, we who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law, because by observing the law, no one will be justified. Now there's a lot here, and I, mean, I could go off on so many rabbit trails, but just in case we get lost in this verse, can I show you what this verse is about? There's three times the word justified is in there. Do you see them? You heard them, but do you see them? And, and you know what? This is Paul's overall argument. What does justified mean? Well, I'll tell you what. It's the same word where we get justice and just, like we want to behave justly, right? Justified means to be declared innocent in a court. Or the presentation of evidence that proves your innocence will tend to justify you, right? In the Bible, it refers to this idea of being declared righteous or having right standing with God. One theologian said, just take out the word justified and substitute acceptable to God. Does that make sense? So, because by observing the law, no one will be acceptable to God. And this is his point. This talks about how is it that you become acceptable to God? You don't do it by observing the law. We know that. And see, and his argument is, we are in a unique time to say this. We are Jewish people. We grew up trying to observe the law. These guys never had it. They never even tried. But we are the people, in other words, we've tasted both this and this. We've done the Pepsi challenge. And we know which one is better. We know how it is that we got saved. They never even tried to obey the law. And that's what he meant really by the, the whole idea of them Gentile sinners. Paul is being sarcastic, but, but the Jews really did look at the Gentiles as a horrifically lost band of sinners because they didn't even have the law. See, they had the true law of God. Couldn't keep it, never did anything for them. I found a, a professor from Hong Kong a Chinese professor of biblical studies. And I pray for this man. I don't know if he's okay or not. I, I really don't. I couldn't find a picture of him, probably because he's hiding out. But let's, let's all pray as we read this quote from Dr. Ronald Fung. You can see he wrote this book on, uh, on the Galatians here. He wrote this. What made the Gentile sinners in the estimation of the Jews was not only that they did not observe the law, but also that they didn't even possess it and consequently lack the possibility of obtaining righteousness through it. So you can't obtain righteousness through the law, but even if you thought you could, those poor guys don't even have it. You getting the point? So that's where we're at here. So we who are Jews, he's saying to these guys around the table, we have the true law of God, and we tried to observe it our whole life. How did that work for you? But, but you and I know better because we are also Jews that accepted Jesus and when he came into your heart, you knew you were saved, right? So that's his point. Is that when he says, we, we have a unique position. We know that a man is not justified or made acceptable by observing the law. So we have put our faith in Jesus, and that is how that we become acceptable to God. Because the law can't do that for you. And this is what's really interesting. This is, sometimes this is mind-blowing for people because they think, well, is, is the law just gone? Well, some of it is. Some of the dietary laws and ceremonial laws, they are. They really have been retired, so to speak. But the moral law of God reflects his character. It was there before human beings ever walked on the earth, and, it's, and it will exist beyond. So we don't, we don't push it away. Jesus says, I, I didn't come to put it away. I came to fulfill it. 
So the law itself reflects God's character, but think of it as like our own laws. You know, I, I'm, I talk a lot about how I behave in traffic uh, because I'm hoping that you can identify with it. There's a road in front of our house that the speed limit is 35 miles an hour. Now, I, just to let you know, this is not just a pet peeve of mine. I'm not trying to lobby anybody in the town council or anything. I have not received a moving violation on this street. Actually, in 20 years, more than 20 years of living in Texas, I've not received a moving violation. That doesn't mean I didn't commit any. <laughs> it means they haven't caught me doing that. Good thing they didn't see me on the way in today. Um, we had flames coming off the back of the car today. The wind was at our back. What can I say? Okay. This, this road, it's 35 miles an hour. I don't know how to go 35 miles an hour on this thing. You have to throw out an anchor and ride the brake to go 35 miles an hour on this street, right? Everybody's going faster than that. The guys mowing the median are going faster than that. And one of them's pushing the mower. So I, I but you know what? I've lived there for more than 20 years and I have really tried. You know, 20 years? Go there and back. You can do this calculation. So that's more than 10,000 times that I have obeyed the, that posted speed limit. But suppose tomorrow I say, you know what? I'm done with this. I'm going with everybody else. And I go 45 and I get caught. Do you think the law cares that for 10,000 times I observed it? Do you think the police officer who... I love and I totally support everywhere. Do you think they know or care? See, the law, thank you, the law, <laughs> it's Ralph's cannabis therapy and we're all working through it with him. <laughs> we're with you, Ralph. <laughs> He's a big guy. I'm going off this way. What do you... I love it. See, the law can only convict you. It's a, it's a sign. It has a number on it. You're either above it or below it, and that's it. It may reflect the character of the neighborhood to some degree, and therefore it's a good guideline. But the law is just a rule that's written down. Suppose I decided, you know what, I, 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 I'm convicted of this, and yeah, I did, I was speeding, you got me on radar, you probably have me from cameras all over, including from space, you know, that's why I wear these shirts is so that I can be identified by the government satellites. If you're going to spy on me, let's, come on, let's make sure you're talking to me. Last thing I want is mistaken identity. But I can't really argue the facts. I'm going faster than 35. I can't argue that. My only hope is to get in front of a human being, a person, to whom I can say, do you understand that 10,000 times, and that's no exaggeration, 10,000 times I obeyed it. I don't know what got into me the other day. I, but everybody else was going faster. I lost track of myself, and I was too. And, and you know what? That person might say, you know what? I see you have a spotless record, uh, so I'm going to throw it out. Isn't that interesting? See, the law can never do that. The law can't throw itself out, but a judge, a human, a person can. And this is the analogy to God's law. The problem with God's law is that we've all violated it before we came in here, and we're, we can't keep it because its standard is perfection. By the way, if you think you can obey the Ten Commandments, you really haven't read the Sermon on the Mount. That's when Jesus was talking to people who thought they'd found ways to obey the Ten Commandments. He's like, no, you just lowered them to the point where you could step over them. That's all. You can't. We can't be perfect. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. See, the sin is falling short of God's expectation. And God's expectation, my gosh, I, I, don't, I really don't want to joke about it as though I'm proud of it, but I fall short of it every day, and I'm aware of that, and I hope you are too. See, that's an offensive concept. That's an offensive concept to people. I get it. 
nobody likes to be told they deserve death. But that's the reality. See, God's standard is perfection, and we show up in a cruise ship that's infected. And he says, I don't think so. Because if, if I got into heaven as I am, it would be imperfection in a perfect place. I don't deserve to go in there. Do you understand that? That's the reality that we all, we don't like to think about ourselves that way. That's offensive. But that is the first understanding that we have to come to, is that you might be a pretty good person when you compare yourself to the rest of the ants. But compared to God's perfect holiness, (laughs) we shouldn't be allowed in. And if we can see that, how much more do you think he can? Well, there's only one way that I can have right standing with God then. I can't obey his law perfectly. I can't. Actually, the law in some ways was written to show me that I couldn't. I'm going to have to find a person, a judge, a human, a, a being that I can appeal to. God himself. And I'm going to have to say, I, I can only throw myself on your mercy. That's exactly what God has arranged for us. Our justification, our declaration of our righteousness does not come by our works or deeds. It cannot. It comes because God is a person who loves us. When we throw ourselves on the mercy of the court, we appeal to the paid blood of Jesus Christ on the cross that says, I'm, I understand he paid for me. I believe in him and I will follow him. And God says, that's all I need to know. Go and sin no more. That quote from Romans, that 3.23 that says we've all sinned and fall short of... We don't always get to... I, I, I probably use that a lot. We don't often get to expand it and see it in context. I'd really love to today because that whole context has more to do with our justification and our salvation than it, than it does the fact that we're all sinners. Let's begin in, in verse 21. Paul says this... But now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. Your right standing with God does not have to be by trying to observe a law that you can't. There's a new way that's been revealed. It was always there. The Old Testament prophets had insight to it. They made reference to it. But now it's been revealed. This righteousness, verse 22, this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference. And there is no difference means two things to me. First of all, there's no difference. When that judge throws my traffic case out, there's no difference to whether I'm declared innocent or whether I never sped. You get it? The righteousness from God He sees it as no difference than if we could have actually obeyed his perfect laws. There's another meaning for no difference, and that's all of those who put their faith in Jesus become new creations, and there is no difference between us. At the foot of the cross, among believers who put their faith in him, there is no difference. I love that double meaning in that verse. I hope you can see it. And then we get to verse 23 that says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came from Jesus, from Christ Jesus. Yeah, we've all sinned, but we can freely be justified. You see that word justified again? We can be declared righteous. The judge is willing to bang the gavel and say, This person, I declare this person innocent. And do you know why? It's not just because they're merciful and they're looking the other way. It's because there's been a price already paid. You see the word redemption? We've been redeemed. Like like you would redeem used beer bottles. Someone paid for us and is washing us out and is going to fill us with better content. That's not a slam against beer. That would be hypocrisy. But we've been redeemed. Someone paid to buy us back. Isn't that awesome? (laughs) 
God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. That's the price that was paid. The sacrifice, the very blood of God was paid on your behalf if you so want it to be applied to you. That should be enough. First, the second half of that verse, he did this to demonstrate his justice because, his for, because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Waiting for Jesus to come, God was always perfectly just. He was waiting for that price to be paid if you're looking at it from that standpoint of time. You and I get to know that price has already been paid. But God exists apart from time. It only needs to be paid once. That's the point. God never gave up his perfect justice. He never did. The other part, verse 26, says, He did this to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. See the words justice, just, and justify all in that sentence. See, God is a perfect judge. He's upholding perfect justice. And yet, he is paying the price for us through Jesus. Isn't that awesome? No man could have thought of this. No one, no human wrote this. That is a divine plan that transcends human thinking. I, I don't even know if you can apprehend it without the Holy Spirit guiding you. That God himself stepped down from the bench, becoming a human being like us to pay a price for us through his death. Amen? Man, I could sing of his love forever. It sounds like a Twyla Paris song. <laughs> Paul goes on to make this argument in verse 17. If while we seek to be justified in Christ, it becomes evident that, our, that we ourselves are sinners, does that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. See, this was an argument that the Judaizers had. The Judaizers wanted everyone to obey the laws of the Jewish people. And they were saying, you know, look, if we don't teach these people the law, they'll just be sinners and it'll be on us. And, and Paul was saying, look, if you sin and you know who Jesus is, is that Jesus' fault? Are you out of your mind? Is another way to translate absolutely not in the Greek. <laughs> think of it. And now he's saying, Peter, think of it. Jesus ate with sinners. Jesus did away with the dietary laws. He says, it's not what goes into your mouth and into your stomach that makes you unclean. It's what comes out of your mouth that reveals the fact that you're unclean. Jesus did away with the Sabbath laws. He did intentional work on the Sabbath just to poke at these people. Do you remember when he made mud in the ground before he healed a guy? He did that because that was considered work. And he did it on the Sabbath just to jab at him. I'm healing by doing work. I'm healing by doing work. That's the way I would have said it. I'm a naughty little boy. <laughs> he said, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a rest that is made for man. Man, it's not made for the Sabbath. While his disciples were with him, they didn't fast. That part has always been appealing to me. <laughs> Nor did they ceremonially wash their hands. Peter, did Jesus, the one who saved you, promote sin? Get real. And then he says this, if I rebuild what I destroyed, I prove that I'm a lawbreaker. Again, a beautiful double meaning here. Rebuilding what I destroyed means I've destroyed the edifice of the law. If I were to rebuild it, if I were to, if I were to go back under the law, all it's going to do is prove I'm a lawbreaker. That's all it can do. But I think there's more than that. I think this is more personal for Paul. I think, I think I hear him saying, maybe through gritted teeth, I'm not going back there again. I lived that life. I was a Pharisee for crying out loud. For Pete's sake, he might have said, because Pete was... <laughs> he might have said that. If after all these years, 
of telling everyone there's no works necessary for your salvation. There's no deed you can do that impresses God. If I were to concede in even the smallest way, okay, well, maybe you have to do this one thing. I'd be guilty of a greater sin than any of you. That's what Paul's saying. If I, if I rebuild what I destroyed, I'm, I would be guilty of the greatest thing. The law, it's gone to me, he says. And this leads him to verse 19. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. Right? All the law ever did for me was convict me of sin. It, it, it only condemned me. So be it. I stand condemned and I die to that law. But I'm still alive because I'm living now for God, the one who saved me. Isn't that awesome? That's beautiful, isn't it? See, and he's hinting at something here that he throws down. And, and now he's no longer just speaking to Peter. He's no longer talking to the Jewish Christians. He's no longer arguing with the Judaizers. What he's about to give you, which I hope you'll put on your refrigerator, is Paul's unique insight. Three years in the desert being taught the gospel by Jesus himself. The man has unique, divine revelation into the gospel, and he throws it down for you here in verse 20. He says this, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul knows something about this that, that you and I just couldn't have learned or picked up on our own in a philosophy class. He knows from his direct conversations with Jesus that he has a radical identification with Jesus. Over 160 times in the New Testament, Paul says, he uses this phrase, in Christ or in the Lord or in him. Do you ever wonder what he meant by that? It's a radical unity. That's why he doesn't just say, I died to this. No, I was crucified. Because Paul sees that he has a radical unity with Jesus. I heard a pastor say this one time, and it really helped me with this, and I hope it helps you. When you genuinely place your faith in Jesus, <laughs> what is true of him becomes true of you. Boom. Isn't that awesome? Now, perhaps at first, we only hope that that, that that's, you know, the way God looks at us. Because we know we're, what's true of Jesus is not necessarily true of us. But see, God exists apart from time. He doesn't just see where we are. He sees what he's going to make of us through eternity. And therefore, he can look at the entirety of our existence beyond our physical life here. And he can see that we've been made righteous and he can see that we, what was true of Jesus is true of us. Isn't that awesome? See, that's why we pray, Lord, make us more like your son, Jesus. See, we're not going to look exactly like him, but on the inside, what's true of him will become true of us. Isn't that awesome? And we know it's not quite yet right now, but you have faith that it will be. Faith because of the one who has promised the one who created a universe by speaking it into existence. The one who parted the Red Sea. The one who makes your conscience work even when you're cut off from all your five senses. The one with the power to do that has promised that he will make you righteous. And so it might be taking a while. I might be growing impatient. My wife might be growing impatient but I have absolute certainty, not in me, but in the one who promises to make me like Jesus. Amen? Gosh, that's just too cool. Martin Luther wrote it this way. Lord Jesus, you are my righteousness. I am your sin. You took on you what was mine, that sinful nature, yet set on me what was yours, righteous nature. You became what you were not, a sinner, that I might become what I was not. 
a righteous and holy son of God. And that's why we get to enjoy that eternal fellowship with God. That's why God finds us acceptable. That's why we have been justified. Isn't that awesome? Because what's true of him becomes true of you. Right? You, you, you feeling guilty? You've already been executed. Apart from time that you and I are just trapped in, we've been crucified with Christ. What's true of him is true of you. You, you feel like you're a slave to sin. You've been freed. What's true of him is true of you. You no longer have to think that way. We might still be stuck in a rut. It takes difficulty to break old habits. We need each other for help, but we are free to think differently about ourselves and no longer be slaves to sin because what's true of him is true of us. <laughs> if you have faith in and you're following Jesus, you have a new life, a resurrected life. And you know, this physical body is going to die. Death is still a reality in this fallen universe, but it no longer has to have the same sting. On Easter, we sing, Christ the Lord is risen today. There's one lyric in there that since my mother died, I can almost never get through. Made like him, like him we rise. What's true of him becomes true of you. You will live again if you have faith in Jesus and you follow him. Don't go on the basis of my enthusiasm or beautifully colored shirts. <laughs> Read it in the word of God written before I was ever born. Amen? Amen? You know, and I know we don't always feel like we're living out a resurrected life. I know we don't always feel that way. Surrender to Jesus. Just give in more and more to the Holy Spirit. And every day we make progress along that path. There's a song. It's really popular at Christmas from a group called Down Here. And it's all one word, Down Here. And it's called How Many Kings. And they only play it at Christmas, which is kind of a shame because the theology of it is so perfect for today. It, it goes like this. At least the chorus does. How many kings step down from their thrones... How many lords have abandoned their homes? How many greats have become the least for me? How many gods have poured out their hearts to romance a world that is torn all apart? How many fathers gave up their sons for me? Only one did that for me. Kyle is going to come forward and lead us in communion here. And even that... That reminds us, right? As we act out our own confession of what's true of Jesus will be true of us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for seeing me through the faith that I have in your son Jesus. Thank you for seeing the eventuality of what I will become as I continue to follow him. Lord, please help me to live a bit more every day like the eternal reality that you will bring about. And allow me to feel and live this resurrected life so strongly that others will see it and they will be drawn to you. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.